Yes, thankful that my hope is in Jesus and that I've been washed in the blood as well. That's the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church Choir with Kelly Moles singing lead, All My Hope is in Jesus. We're featuring music from our fall 2023 revival, and we'll be doing that for the rest of the year. There's that much good music to share with you. We hope that you're enjoying it. Uh, Welcome to the second hour of the Mount Pleasant Bible Institute video podcast from Monday, November 13th, 2023. I'm Dr. Joseph Speciali, thrilled that you've chosen to spend part of your day with us studying the Word of God. We just finished up hour number one, studying the book of Genesis. If you haven't been able to listen to that yet, we encourage you to do so. We talked about the potential barrier or veil that exists between the second and the third heaven. Very interesting. So if you get a chance to listen to that, we encourage you to do so. We're going to jump right into the lesson, Matthew chapter 12, talking about the malice of the Pharisees. The malice of the Pharisees. And uh, where we left off, verse 26, verse 27, the Pharisees have accused the Lord Jesus Christ of casting out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. This man, who was previously blind and dumb, was able to see and to speak after the Lord cast the devil out. And they've accused the Lord of using demonic power to do this, that he's somehow in league with the devil in making this miracle happen. And the Lord now speaking... Um, parabolically with them, giving them illustrations on how that is so absurd that just because he successfully cast out these devils and this man who had these physical infirmities is now able to see that all of that is an indication he's in league with the devil is just absurd. Because if he cast out devils by the devil, the devil's kingdom couldn't stand, verse 26. And this is where we get the cliche, a house divided against itself cannot stand, or united we stand, divided we fall. All that comes from verse 25. Isn't that interesting? So we pick up our account here in verse number 27. Jesus says, And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. So what does the Lord mean here when he says, By whom do your children cast them out? Why didn't he just say, by whom do you cast them out? Well, I take it to mean that the specific Pharisees that are making this accusation of Jesus, that they themselves hadn't conducted any exorcisms, but there were members of the Pharisaical order that had conducted exorcisms. They're referred to here as their children. Now, children here in the sense, children mean offspring, a younger generation, and so on. Uh, We know from uh, Matthew 10, verse 42, where the Lord uses the term, um, I think it's little ones. Matthew 10, verse 42, where he says, And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple. Verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. The little one there refers to a disciple. In John 13, 33, the Lord addressing his disciples refers to them as little children. So the point being is that children can refer to not just your physical offspring, but your educational offspring, a teacher-student relationship, a master-protege or disciple relationship. So the Lord's disciples were his children. The Pharisees' disciples were their children. So the specific Pharisees making this accusation may not have cast out any devils, but they had students or a younger generation of Pharisees that profess to have done that. And Jesus is invoking that, saying, if you're saying that I cast out devils because I'm in league with the devil, then how are your rabbinical students, how how are they able to cast out devils? 
because we're doing the same thing. By whom do your children cast them out? Whoever's performing those exorcisms is invoking a name. By whom do your children cast them out? We don't know for certain, but I would think that these exorcists were casting out devils in the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And exorcist is not anything new. It's clearly given in the Bible. Acts 19, verse 13, we see seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, who attempted to cast out devils in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preached. They didn't have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. They weren't saved, but they knew that the power uh, that there was power in the name of Jesus, and the disciples, the apostles, were casting out devils in the name of Jesus, so they took it upon themselves to try the same with catastrophic results. And not only did the exorcism fail, but the devil then proceeded to beat them to a pulp, every last one of them, and tear them and all that in Acts 19. So not anyone can cast out devils. And uh, when I when we say that anyone's casting out devils, the only one who can cast out devils by his own power is the Lord Jesus. Let's make that clear. Even the sign of the apostles of casting out devils in Mark 16, the apostles aren't doing that under their own power. I guarantee you that. They're doing it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And <clears throat> that particular sign, no longer with us today, those signs followed them that believe during the apostolic era, along with drinking deadly things and it not hurting you, speaking in new tongues and all of that, laying hands on the sick and they recover. Okay, all of those were apostolic signs. We're not apostles. Um, however, devils can be cast out today. And uh, we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail in a moment, how that's done. And uh, tread very lightly there, because we don't want to give anyone false impressions, okay? We want to be very clear. So I think the children here are a reference to students of the Pharisees, a younger generation. And they had professed to cast out devils, and the Lord is just simply contending that if... uh, if uh, you believe, if you allege that I'm casting out devils because I'm in league with the devil, then you got to apply that same argument to your own disciples because they profess to cast out devils too. And that's why he says, therefore, they shall be your judges. So if they were to go to those disciples, they would certainly refute any notion that they were in league with the devil because they supposedly cast out devils, Okay. Not at all. They would say they were doing it by the power of God. And if it was happening, it was happening by the power of God, just as it was with with the Lord Jesus. Okay, verse 28. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, and of course there's no doubt that that's exactly how Jesus was doing it, but he's he's granting them their allegation. Okay, If, if you're right, if you're right, then, but if not... So he says, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Um, Luke's account states that the Lord cast out devils with the finger of God, which reminds me we want to get our parallel Bible up. I don't know that we'll be referring to it just yet because this particular um parallel Bible that we have on the screen right now only has Mark's account. It doesn't include Luke's, so I'm going to have to read Luke's to you. But we do want to remind you that as we go through our study of Matthew, that you have multiple Bible sources handy so that you can follow along with us as we go back and forth comparing the various accounts as we go verse by verse. But in Luke's account, Luke 11 and verse number 20, it says this, But if I with the finger of God cast out devils... So the Lord cast out devils three ways. Three ways. In Matthew 8, verse 16, he cast out devils with his word. And so does the word of God play a part in casting out devils? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Number two, as we read here in Matthew's account, by the Spirit of God. Yep, the Spirit of God plays a essential role in casting out devils. Uh, because, folks, if that person doesn't get saved, if that person does not get saved, and getting saved, having the Holy Spirit thereby occupy their, their hearts, that devil can come right back. And we'll see later on in chapter 12, when and if those situations arise, that person's going to be in a worse position than what they began. Okay, so this whole idea <clears throat> of having the ability, the spiritual power to lay your hands on somebody and declare the devils to come out of them in the name of Jesus, that means absolutely nothing unless that person gets saved. Absolutely nothing, because those devils are going to come right back and make it worse for that person. So that's why I say person getting saved is the key in any <clears throat> deliverance from devil possession. All right, so he also cast them out with the finger of God, according to Luke 11.20. So he casts out devils with his word, by the Spirit, and with the finger of God. Then the kingdom of God is come unto you. The kingdom of God is in contrast to the kingdom of Satan that we read in verse 26. And what we learn here from this verse is a very important truth. And that is, devils cannot be in the kingdom of God. Note again, the devils came out. They were cast out. And Jesus said, the kingdom of God has come. Devils cannot be. Cannot, not will not, cannot. <clears throat> cannot be in the kingdom of God. And by the way, in regard to the kingdom of heaven, they, they won't be in the kingdom of heaven either, because we read in Zechariah 13, verse 2, that at the end of the tribulation, at the end of the battle of Armageddon and all that, Satan's cast into the bottomless pit. That's in Revelation 20. Zechariah 13, 2 says the unclean spirit is going to pass out of the land, so Satan's not going to be alone. <clears throat> In the pit, every unclean spirit, every fallen angel is going to join him and be cast into the pit. And this world is going to be without any devil or devils for the entire thousand years. The kingdom of heaven is the outward, visible, earthly, Davidic aspect of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is the eternal, spiritual, invisible aspect of the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is entered into physically. You can be born into it. You can enter into it by surviving the tribulation. Okay? But to survive the tribulation and enter the kingdom of heaven, you've got to be born again. Okay? But there'll be people physically born into the kingdom of heaven during the millennial kingdom, obviously. The kingdom of God, there's only one way in. By being born again. That's it. The only way. Uh, since devils cannot be in the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is within the born-again believer, and it is, Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of God is within you. So, devils can't be in the kingdom of God, and for the born-again believer, the kingdom of God is in us, then that means a devil, or the devil, cannot be in the at any time, a born-again believer. Cannot. Can't happen. It's impossible for a true born-again believer to be devil-possessed. He can be oppressed, afflicted, um, all that, but not possessed. 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So the, the devil or devils cannot occupy the same space that the Holy Spirit of God does. And when we get saved, the Holy Spirit of God comes in. Just as the kingdom of God is within us, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in what? The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost comes in. And so those spirits must vacate. <clears throat> 
Luke's account, again, in Luke eleven twenty one adds this. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are at peace. And then we begin verse 29 of Matthew 12, where it says, Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man? And then he will spoil his house. So I, I, I want to begin with going to Luke's account here and giving you an illustration. Luke eleven twenty two adds this. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divideth his spoils. So, What the Lord's saying here in the illustration he's given is a, a, a strong man in his house and how can someone spoil this strong man of his goods? And when we take into consideration Luke's account, there's only one way. There, the, the one that's going to do the spoiling has got to be stronger than the strong man. And he's got to bind him. He's got to bind him. Okay. So think of it this way. The only way a thief is going to spoil a house is if the occupant, the one who owns the house and lives in it, is, is, is the only way he's going to spoil it, if the occupant, the owner of the house, is present and awake, he's got to bind him. He's got to bind him. Okay, If he's asleep, he might be able to get in and get out. But if he's awake, the only way he's going to spoil that house is if he binds the occupant of the house. And that's because as long as the occupant of the house is loose and awake, he is going to fight. He may not even be stronger than the thief. But as long as he's loose and able to fight, he's going to fight. And he's probably going to prevent the thief from spoiling his house. The only way the occupant can be bound is if the thief or someone assisting the thief is stronger than the occupant. Okay? So that's the point here. Going back to the start of verse 29, or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods? The one there in this parable represents Jesus. The strong man, that represents the devils or the devil, the, the ones possessing the body. The house, the strong man's house, that is the person's body that's possessed by the devils. So uh, the, the devils are strong men. They're strong. They're stronger than the man who owns the body. Okay, But the one here... If he's going to get these devils out, if he's going to spoil this house, he's got to be stronger than those devils. And he is. That's Jesus. <laughs> Except he first <clears throat> bind the strong man. As I said, Luke adds, a stronger than he, someone stronger than the strong man, has to come upon him and overcome him. And that's exactly what Jesus did here. To cast the devils out of this blind and dumb man, he's stronger than these devils. He bound them and spoiled the house. <coughs> Excuse me. And then in Luke's account, Luke adds in verse 22 of Luke 11, he taketh from him all his armor, wherein he trusted. Excuse me. Then he will spoil his house. And that pictures the fact that when the Lord casts out devils and the person regains their sanity, their, their health, their ability, in this case, to see and speak, the Lord spoiled them. Uh, the Lord spoiled principalities and powers on the cross, didn't he? Colossians 2, verse 15. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He overcame the one who had the power of death, that is the devil, took the key of, of death from him. 
The Lord is the one now with the keys of death and hell. 1 John 3, verse 8, he destroyed the works of the devil. He's stronger. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, then he will spoil his house? So again, the one who's the stronger is Jesus. He's the one who spoils and, and uh, the strong man's house. And the strong man represents the devil or the devils, and the house represents the man's body. Okay? And by the way, the word house is used to speak about not just our earthly body, but our heavenly body in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 1. All right, let's move on then. Uh, oh, before we move on, because I, I told you we talk about devil possession. Yes. Okay, so let's back it up before we move on to verse 30. Casting out devils today. And I'm not giving you this information based on personal field experience. I'm not doing that. Um, I do believe that devil possession is on the increase. I think it's increasing significantly in our world and in our country. I think there's far more devil possession happening right here in America than what we want to believe. I think the hatred that we see towards the Jewish people right now cannot be dismissed as mere political fervor, okay, or wokeness. I think there's a lot of devil possession. People being literally possessed of devils to that inspires this, this blind hatred of the Jewish people. And I think it's going to keep increasing exponentially till, till Jesus comes. I do. That's what happened before his first coming. People were possessed. We <clears throat> Jesus acknowledged here that some of the disciples, the children of the Pharisees, were casting out devils. So that was happening even before Jesus' ministry. But when Jesus shows up, begins his earthly ministry, devil possession pew, goes through the roof. Okay? And that's, I, I think, going to be uh, repeated in the days leading up to his second coming. So I think we're seeing that. The other thing I want to reiterate is uh, we have to fully acknowledge that the apostolic gifts are no longer relevant. So Mark 16, verse 16, 17, 18, long in there, these signs shall follow them that believe, they shall uh, speak with new tongues, they shall cast out devils, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall cover, and if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them, all that, that's not for you and me. Okay? We don't have those gifts. Those were given to the apostles to confirm the word that they were preaching was divinely inspired revelation from God, okay? Because the Jews required a sign to believe. So those signs were given to the apostles. With the completion of the New Testament canon, we don't need signs to believe if something's of God or not. How do we base if what somebody says is the truth or not? Is it divinely inspired or not? Does it line up with the book? Because if they speak not according to this word, there's no light in them. So you want a sign? Your sign's right here. It's the Bible. Okay. Nevertheless, we do have power over unclean spirits. Jesus has given this, given us this power. It's in His name. It's not in our name. It. We don't have power to just go around and yanking devils out of people. And as I said earlier, when it comes to casting out devils, <clears throat> if the person who's possessed doesn't end up getting saved, it's all a worthless activity anyway. Because the devils can come right back with a vengeance and repossess that person. Okay? <clears throat> But we mentioned how the Lord cast out devils with his word. There's got to be scripture quoted. Number two, by the Spirit of God. We have to acknowledge that, that there, there has to be the power of the Spirit of God at work in saving this person. <clears throat> and also, as we read here in verse 28 and 29, there's got to be a binding. 
the Lord who is the stronger man has to bind these devils before there can be any spoiling. Not going to happen, okay? There's got to be a binding. After all, how can you or me even speak to the person who's possessed? How can we get past the devils to speak to the person unless those devils are bound and sealed? Because those devils know who you are and they know who I am. We show up. And they're going to be ready with a bunch of blasphemies and horrible statements. And how are we going to even speak to the person as long as those devils are in the way? Saying these obscenities and these blasphemies, turning the person's head 360 degrees, causing them to crawl up the wall backwards, causing them to levitate, causing them to puke. I mean, think of all the exorcist stuff. All to scare us, all to intimidate us, all to distract us. How do we get to even speak to the person unless we go in pleading the blood of Jesus over us and over that place, claiming the authority and the power of the name of Jesus and declare that the Lord, through his Holy Spirit, bind and seal the spirits possessing this person so that we can speak with them, the person and them alone. We've got to find out. We've got to speak with them and find out if they want deliverance. Do they want to be freed of this spirit or these spirits that possess them? Are they willing to receive Jesus Christ, put their faith and trust in him as their personal Savior? Because if they're not, there is no deliverance. Again, it's just we're wasting our time. The devils have possessed this person because somewhere in their life there's been a breakdown of their will. They've given these spirits an open door into their mind and into their life. They've, they've, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They have, I don't want to say empowered them or encouraged it, but they've, in a sense, invited it. The devil just can't possess you against your will. He, He can't do that. Okay. So something's happened in their life where they've allowed this to happen. And we've got to be able to get them to admit they don't want it to be that way anymore. And we've got to get them to the place where they're also willing to receive Jesus as their Savior. Not just to get rid of the devils, but because they need to be saved. They're going to hell. Because this experience is nothing compared to what eternity is going to be like if they don't receive Jesus. They've got to be willing to receive Jesus. And if they get saved, then the precious Holy Spirit of God moves in, and those devils, they, they're out. They're cast out. The Spirit of God's going to cast them out. And they can't come back. They can't come back. Okay? But there's... We've got to ask the Lord to bind those things and seal them, shut them up so that we could speak to that person. And man, you've got to have, (laughs) I I just can't imagine um, the grace that you've got to have and the courage you've got to have in the Lord in order to do any and all of this. I mean, it's easy for me to say this. I, I know what we should do. But to be in that moment, right across from somebody who has these foul spirits actually in them, just inches or feet away from you, that's a totally different animal. Okay, Doesn't change the fact you have authority over them. Doesn't change the fact of the Lord doing what what only he can do. But man, to be in that moment, you, you best be in fellowship with the Lord. Okay? Don't be 
one of those seven sons of one Sceva Jew. Okay. All right, so I hope that makes sense. Um, again, I've not had the, that experience. I know some missionaries that have. They've come face to face with people possessed of devils. And uh, I'm sure they would all agree with me. There's no devils going out of anybody, okay, unless the person gets saved. They've got to get saved. You've got to somehow reach them. And the Lord's got to be the one to bind these spirits. We've got to claim the, the blood of Jesus, to proclaim the name of Jesus, quote scripture. The devil hates scripture. He hates the blood. All of that. We have to invoke it all. All right, so verse number 30, as we move on, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Boy, it doesn't get any plainer than that. So in a day and age where some people, for p political reasons, are noncommittal, you ask them a clear, close-ended question. In other words, the answer can only be yes or no. And they answer you with a narrative with talking points, with a word salad even. I mean, anything but a simple yes or a simple no. I mean, we're living in a day and age where people are just so non-committed. They straddle the fence. They play both sides. I fear that that's happening in our country right now in a very important uh, situation with Israel. We have to stand unapologetically and clearly with them. I don't believe we are. I think we're playing both sides. Um, and the Lord makes it clear here that he that is not with me is against me. So to be on the Lord's side, you get on the Lord's side. You do that by choosing to receive him as your personal Savior. You put your faith and trust in him, and you're in the Lord's army. You're on his side. You are on the Lord's side by getting on the Lord's side. If you do nothing, if you if you plead the fifth, if you if you say, I'm Switzerland, I'm neutral, and, and I'll make my decision later, then you're against him. No, I'm, I, I didn't say I'm on the devil's side. I'm not for the devil, but you are. But you are. That's where you're wrong. You don't get to call the shots. The Lord is saying it very clear here. He regards anyone who is not with him. So even those who are Switzerland, if you're not with him, you are against him. What you think about it doesn't matter. That's what he says. He that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. So there is no neutral ground in this spiritual war. There's, there's none. There are no Switzerlands. I know there's some who think they are, and they fancy themselves and pride themselves on that. They'll make a decision, just not today. They've made their decision then. I mean, a person who is thinking about getting saved is still lost. They're lost. They believe that, you know, uh, eternity is on standby, that it's, it's in time out for them. That if they die right now being in this state of, I haven't received Jesus, but I haven't rejected him either. I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. They think that the Lord's going to hold up and that if they die, he's going to say, okay, before I send you to heaven or hell, what's your decision now? That's not how it goes. If you've not received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're lost, and you're on your way to hell. If you're not on the Lord's side, if you've not chosen him as your Savior, you've not trusted him, you're against him in this spiritual war. And it doesn't matter what you think or what you profess. He regards you as his enemy. He regards you as your enemy. That ought to... That ought to scare you to death. So we're either on the Lord's side or Satan's side. Let's take a look 
to some scripture here. <laughs> Finally getting to some scripture here. How about uh, Exodus 32, 26? Then Moses stood at the gate of the camp and said, Who's on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. Joshua 24, 15, Joshua says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 1 Kings 18, 21, the battle on Mount Carmel here. Elijah came unto all the people and said, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. See? Non-committal. Make a choice. Pick a side. They said, nah, maybe we won't. Maybe we won't pick a side yet. Well, Jesus has told us the truth of the matter. If you're not with him, you're against him. If you're, if you haven't received him as your savior, then you're still part of the kingdom of Satan, and you're on his side, not the Lord's. All right, verse thirty-one. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Now, a lot of information here to uh, peel back and break down here. Um, we're not going to get through it all tonight, so we'll just get as far as we can in the few minutes we have left. But first we want to address that there are some people who believe, uh, and they're called universalists, they believe that in the end, everyone's going to be saved, even the devil. Everyone's going to be saved. No one's going to hell for all of eternity. Nobody. And so they say that the first part of this verse here supports that. All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But they haven't read the rest of the verse, have they? But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. So not every sin is forgiven. Not every sin is forgiven. And we're going to explain this blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. We're going to explain that in more detail next week. We don't have time to get into it right now. Okay. We know what some teach it to be. And there's many people who give false teachings on it. There's some people who believe that it's an unforgivable sin. And we'll see next week when we compare the parallel passage in Mark, it's not necessarily the unforgivable, unpardonable sin. All right? We'll show you that next week. As well as what it specifically is. And with that, we'll also be able to determine, can the sin of blaspheming the Holy Ghost be committed today? Can it be committed today? And again, there's many in the Pentecostal world who believe, <clears throat> yes, it can, and done quite frequently, in fact, so they say. Again, we'll go through all of that next time and explain the Bible truth regarding it and why some very good people just happen to be mistaken in their beliefs on this, okay? But what we want to close with here tonight, uh, let's see. Yeah, let's, let's close with this. Uh, let's close with the word blasphemy here. We have up on the slides right now a very extensive list of those who have been accused of blasphemy, which means they may or may not have been guilty of it. Because you see number eight on the list is Jesus Christ. Well, he, he wasn't guilty of blasphemy. He was accused of it, though. So people who've been accused of blasphemy or were just flat out guilty of blasphemy. And it's an extensive list. We're going to run through that real quick here in a minute. But let's define what blasphemy is. Blasphemy, by definition, is an indignity, an injury, or an offense that's offered to God either orally or even in writing. And 
in it, the person denies what is due to God or attributing to him that which is contrary to his nature. It's to be reproachful or contemptuous or irreverent against the Lord. So any of those things, an in indignity, injury, or an offense given to God orally or in writing by denying what's due to him or attributing to him something that's completely contrary to his nature. To be reproachful to him, contemptuous, or irreverent to him. Now right here in the context, we have a definition of blasphemy. Verse 32 So verse 31, it's blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. But in verse 32, middle of the verse, it's defined as speaking against the Holy Ghost. So that's a simple definition of blasphemy, is to speak against something. And here, the scribes and Pharisees are one of many throughout the Bible that are either accused of or guilty of blasphemy. Okay? And so let's take a look at that list as we close out tonight's lesson. The very first instance of blasphemy is the Israelitish woman's son in Leviticus 24.11. You have Naboth. Naboth accused of blasphemy by those false witnesses that Jezebel paid off. Naboth, the type of Christ. You have Rabshiki and the servants of the king of Assyria who were guilty of blaspheming the Lord. 2 Kings 19.6, Isaiah 37.6. By the way, Naboth, forgot to give you that reference, 1 Kings 21, verse 10 and 13. The king of Assyria, historically Sennacherib, prophetically the Antichrist, guilty of blasphemy. 2 Kings 19.22, Isaiah 37.23. In Psalms, the enemy is guilty of blasphemy, Psalm 74.10. Foolish people, Psalm 74.18. The fathers, the Jewish fathers, that is, Isaiah 65.7, Ezekiel 20, verse 27. The Lord Jesus Christ accused of blasphemy, numerous occasions, of course, falsely so. Uh, Matthew 9.3, Matthew 26.65, Mark 2.7, Mark 14, 64, Luke 5, 21, John 10, verses 33 and 36. The scribes and Pharisees, the Lord's essentially accusing them of blaspheming the Holy Spirit right here in Matthew 12, 31, Luke 12, 10. The heart of men, Matthew 15, 19, Mark 7, 22, blasphemy is one of the fruits of the works of our heart, out of the heart of men. The sons of men are men, Mark 3, 28, 29. 2 Timothy 3, 2. Revelation 16, verse 9, 11, and 21. The Roman soldiers, Luke 22, 65. Stephen falsely accused of blasphemy. Acts 6, verse 11 and 13. The Jews, Acts 13.45, Acts 18.6, Romans 2.24. <coughs> Excuse me. Persecuted believers, Acts 26.11. The old nature, it's blasphemous. Colossians 3.8. The Apostle Paul, 1 Timothy 1.13. Hymenaeus and Alexander, 1 Timothy 1.20. Rich men, James 2, verse 7. Them which say they are Jews and are not, Revelation 2, 9. And then finally the Antichrist in Revelation 13, verses 1, 5, and 6, and chapter 17, verse 3. And this is where we'll pick up next time. But blasphemy is one of the sins that's committed against the Holy Spirit. And here's the rest of them. Sins against the Holy Spirit include vexing him, Isaiah 63.10, blaspheming him, Matthew 12.31, Mark 3.29, lying to him, Acts 5.3, tempting him, Acts 5.9, resisting him, Acts 7.51, grieving him, Ephesians 4.30, 
quenching him, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, and doing despite to him, Hebrews 10, 29. So this is where we'll pick up next time on what the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is. We'll stop there for tonight. All right. Uh, before we go, as we often, as we always do, not often, but always do, okay? We want to make sure that those of you who are not 100% certain that you're saved, that you have the opportunity to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. <clears throat> if you're not 100% certain that there was a time in your life that you admitted you were a sinner and called out to the Lord to forgive you of your sins and save your soul, where you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior and asked him to save you, why don't you do that right now? The Bible says that we're all sinners. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because of that, we're all under the sentence of death and separation for all of eternity from God. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. And Revelation 21.8 says the unbelieving shall have their part in the lake of which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And so I'm sure that if you're listening to me, that's not where you want to spend eternity. So can you tonight admit that you're a sinner? Can you agree with the word of God tonight that you are a sinner? and that you don't want to go to hell, then I've got good news for you. The Lord Jesus Christ paid that price for you. That's why he came from heaven to this earth, was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life for 33 and a half years, and died spiritually and physically on an old rugged cross. He did that to pay that wage, which is death, he paid the wages of your sin by dying for your sins and for mine. Paid the price in full. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Romans 5, 8 puts it this way, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. John three sixteen says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's why Jesus died on the cross, to pay the price for your sins and for mine, so that eternal life can be offered to everybody as a free gift. But it doesn't become yours unless you claim it by faith. You've got to receive Jesus as your Savior, and you do that by calling upon him asking him to forgive you of your sins. And so, I asked if you believed you were a sinner. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day? Do you believe that? Do you believe he'd save you if you asked him? <clears throat> then let's ask him. Let's pray right now and put your trust in Jesus. Pray with me now. Dear God in heaven, I admit that I'm a lost sinner, and I do deserve to go to hell for my sins, Lord. But thank you that you love me so much that you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus, to die on the cross to pay for my sins. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving me so much to die for my sins. I believe that you died, and I believe you rose again the third day. I believe that if I asked you to forgive me, you would. And so the best way I know how, I am asking you to forgive me of all my sins and come into my heart and save my soul. I'm putting my trust in you, Lord, to get me to heaven. Not anything I've ever done and not anything I'll ever do just you. Help me to live for you now. In your name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and meant it, <clears throat> the Bible says in Romans 10 verse 13 that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
All right, folks, our time has come and gone. Our time has come and gone. I don't think uh, we have music queued up for you, so we're just going to cut on out uh, without any music here to close out. We do just want to remind you to study to show yourselves approved unto God, to put on the whole armor of God, and to be steadfast, unmovable, and always abound in the work of the Lord. We love you, folks. We're praying for you. Pray that I get over all of this. This is very pesky. It's frustrating. It's tough to stay focused and all of that, but thank you for bearing with me. Just uh, pray for me as I pray for you, okay? We love you. We'll see you next time. Good night, folks.